So, so, okay, so let me begin with part two. I'll first talk about a, a fairly simple problem, which is going, which is going to be um, about estimation and inference on structural parameters in an instrumental variable model with many instruments. And we will use Lasso to select instruments. And then we're going to perform inference on, on the main coefficient of interest. In my presentation, I will focus on a simple IV model where we have y. This is our outcome variable. This is uh, di. This is the endogenous variable of interest. It's going to be a scalar. Uh, the alpha is the parameter of interest that we care about. This is a disturbance. Endogenous variable d is related to instruments, zi, via unspecified function g. This is this disturbance in the first stage. And g here is obviously the, um, well, with this assumption that the uh, vi conditional on, on the instrument has mean 0, this, is, uh, this g is a regression function. It's a regression function. It's a conditional expectation of di given zi. And this regression function in this context could be called the optimal, um, optimal instrument. Okay. So we have the endogeneity in this model. So this, uh, if we stack these two errors together, they have mean 0 conditional on the instrument. And they are correlated, which is the cause for endogeneity. Um, we could also have additional controls, wi, entering both equations. But uh, to simplify the presentation, I just suppress those controls. And I assume that we, we, we've, par we've partialed those out, okay, just because I want to focus on, on, uh, on this simple structure. And so we just assume those controls have been partialed out. Um, also, we could have multiple endogenous variables. But uh, I will just present the results for a single endogenous variables. And I will refer you to, to, uh, to, to the papers for, for details and generalizations. So the main ta target parameter is alpha. And here, g is the unspecified uh, regression function, which is actually a nuisance function. Okay. And we will use uh, high-dimensional sparse modeling to, to, uh, to approximate this g function and use Lasso to estimate this uh, function g. So we are in a setup where we have either many instruments. So I'll call this x size um, uh, the, the ultimate instruments that we will use. Zi could be, uh, it could be equal to the original instruments that we have available. Or the, the final instruments could also be generated as transformations of the original instruments by taking uh, polynomial transformations and interactions and, uh, and various other operations. Obviously, we could have a mix of the, of the two cases as well. Right? So the number of instruments, x here, is, go is, go is going to be large. And again, it's going to be possibly much larger than the sample size. Right. So we will use Lasso for that. We will um, assume approximate sparsity, namely this regression function g, or the optimal instrument, could be decomposed in two parts. One part is going to be sparse approximation. Another part is approximation error. And uh, the sparse approximation will have s non-zero coefficients in it, whereas it's going to be much smaller than the sample size. I will define what this means in a moment. And the approximation error will be small conjecture to the size of the estimation error for this regression function. So what this assumption is saying is that, well, the optimal instrument is approximated by s unknown instruments. s itself is unknown. But s is small compared to n. Compared to n. So we, call, we can call these s, the, the, uh, s instruments the, the effective instruments. And what we're going to do, we're going to search for those instruments using Lasso. And we will form the estimate of the optimal instrument via post lasso. So we run lasso, find the, find the instruments, and we run least squares to find the uh, optimal instrument approximately. And so this gives us a single instrument. And then what we do, we, we, uh, we go ahead and uh, compute the two stage least squares estimates of alpha using this single, single in instrument, single constructed instrument.
Okay. So to motivate this uh, setup, let me um, present the following familiar example. This is an angry Krieger example. Uh, in this example, Y is a wage, D is in education, it's treated as endogenous. The target parameter of interest is returns to schooling. Right. ZI, the basic instruments include the quarter of birth dummies, there are three of them, as well as controls. There are 50 state of birth uh, 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 dummies, and there are also seven year of birth dummies. So the final set of technical instruments is going to be uh, a set of transformations of these basic instruments. So it's going to include ZI and also all the interactions, all possible interactions. It's actually not very well known, but if you take uh, all the possible interactions, you end up with 1,530 instruments. And most of the time, people don't, don't use all of those instruments. But you do have 1,530 instruments. So it's a very large, uh, very large set of instruments. OK. And, and here we have two basic options. I mean, obviously, we have many options, but there are, there are at least two basic options. One is to just use a few instruments, like, for, like three, three quarter of birth instruments, the obvious ones. Um, or we could all use all the instruments. That would be another option. But turns out that either one of those options gives like, big, big standard errors when you properly count for the fact that you're using many instruments. Right? So it seems a good idea to, to do instrument selection to see if we can improve. Okay. So here I show a, t a t table where we have three rows. So this is two stagely squares with three basic instruments, quadro of birth dummies. The schooling coefficient estimate is 10%. The robust standard error, uh, standard error is two, two, uh, 0.02, or 2%. Two the next basic option is, uh, is the IV estimator, where we use all the IV estimator. So sorry, we use all the, uh, we, we use all the instruments. And here, I use actually Fuller's form of two stagely squares because it's robust under many instruments. So Chris and Whitney uh, uh, and Jerry Hausman, they have a nice paper um, uh, about the Fuller's form of two-stagely squares. That it, uh, um, it turns out that this estimator is the right form of two-stagely squares if you want to work with many, many instruments. Okay? So I'm, uh, I'm using the state-of-the-art of estimator here. And the estimate is 10% uh, 10, 10 as well. But the standard error is uh, is, is is big, like four four um, four percent. So this is a robust standard error. It accounts for the fact that there are many instruments. So the next line is going to be the two stagely squares estimator with uh, lasso selected instruments. So here we end up selecting twelve instruments, including the basic instruments, the three quarter of birth dummies. Okay, and some technical instruments, like including interactions of those quarter of birth dummies with some of the controls. The point estimate is the same. I mean, in the, in the third digit, they differ, actually, but the first two digit coincide. Uh, the, the, and uh, the standard error is uh, small compared to either one of those. So this is, this, this is a, I would say, this is a nice set um, of results. Uh, so we get uh, very tight, uh, very precise estimates of the schooling coefficients. Uh, and uh, what I will do next, I will justify this est estimator here. I will say that under the approximate sparsity assumptions, this is a good way to do IV estimation. It's good, it's good to, do, to use lasso to, to select instruments. And I will justify this uh, robust standard errors here. Okay, so the, 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 these results are going to be fully theoretically justified in, in what follows. To give a formal uh, statement, I will define the two stagely squares estimator formally. So it, uh, we have uh, uh, two steps in the estimation procedure. In step one, we estimate the optimal instrument uh, by using the post-lasso estimator. So we run lasso. 
select the instruments, then we uh, predict the optimal instrument uh, using the least squares estimator. So the, that gives us g hat of zi equals to xi beta hat, the estimate of the optimal instrument. And in step two, we compute the two stage least squares using the optimal instrument as the IV, or estimated optimal instrument as the IV. Okay, so he, what we have here is the standard expression for the IV estimator with a single endogenous variable and a single instrument. Here, the single optimal instrument. So this is cross product between G and Y. This is the inverse of the cross product between D and uh, D, D and G, the, the optimal instrument, right? Just standard expression. Okay, here's the result. Again, under practical regularity conditions that include uh, the conditions that I've listed before, as well as the following conditions, uh, we have uh, this uh, result. So let me describe the conditions um, that we add here. So the optimal instrument needs to be sufficiently sparse, and here we're making the assumption that S squared is small compared to N. So before we were making the assumption that S was small compared to N, and here we make a stronger assumption that S squared is small compared to N. The second assumption we make is that the instrument the optimal instrument is strong, namely the correlation between the endogenous variable and the optimal instrument is bounded away from zero. So that's our second assumption. Under these assumptions, we have that the IV estimator, alpha hat minus the estimate times the standard scaling factor approaches a normal distribution with mean zero and variance one. So here, the scaling factor involves the standard white robust formula for the um, two stage least squares estimator, so there's, there's nothing special there. And moreover, the estimator, this estimator, is semi parametrically efficient under homoscedasticity. So it means, under the same assumptions, you cannot find a better estimator such that this estimator is asymptotically normal, like this, and has asymptotically smaller standard there. So you cannot do systematically better than this, uh, than this estimator under these approximate sparsity assumptions. Right. So this result was established in the, in the paper by Bologna, uh, Chen, Daniel Chen, uh, uh, Chris Hansen, and myself in the eco Econometrica paper. Right. Uh, there you can find a general statement, a detailed listing of regularity conditions, uh, handling of uh, omitted controls, and things like this. Also, if you don't like some of these assumptions that I've stated here, so for example, the strong instrument assumption, we do have a weak instrument robust procedure in the paper available, the, the so-called subscore test. Okay. Also, this assumption could be relaxed by jackknifing or by, by using split, split, uh, sample splitting techniques, so this assumption could also be relaxed. Okay, but this assumption is what we need for this basic, uh, basic method to work. And I guess the key point here is that the selection mistakes that we make in selecting the instruments here, they are asymptotically neg negligible. Somehow they don't show up in the asymptotics here, first order asymptotics, they, they, they become uh, more and more negligible as the sample size becomes bigger. And uh, <laughs> Um, this occurs because the estimating equations that the least squares uses, the two-stage least squares uses, has a so-called low bias property. And I will discuss this property later, but right now I just want to say the, the intuition for this result is as follows. So what Lasso does here, it, it finds some obviously good instruments with large coefficients. And it's going to be making mistakes on instruments that have small predictive power for the treatment variable, for the endogenous variable. Right? And whether or not we drop those instruments, it actually does not affect identification of, of alpha, the main parameter. So intuitively, uh, this dropping those instruments was, uh, that have small predictive power for the, uh, for, for the treatment variable is, is OK. So it, it doesn't harm the first order asymptotics. So this is, a, this is actually a nice example where the post-selection inference works, doesn't break down. And this is, this is actually very special. It, 
it's not a it will not, it will not be true more generally like if you if you if you if you if you're doing post selection inference be careful be care, be very careful here it's fine um, and it's it occurs because um, this problem is is somewhat special and uh, I will explain later towards the end of my talk what's so special about it and along with um, along with um, other explanations that I will provide okay so let's uh, let's see uh, if this theoretical result works in Monte Carlos it's a good it's a, it's, a, it's a good sanity check so we've done an extensive set of exp computational experiments and I will give you just Two, uh, two, two, two typical examples. Two typical examples that are calibrated somewhat to the um, to the empirical example that we analyze in, in this paper. The paper, this paper that I mentioned here. Right? So in that example, uh, everything is Gaussian, and the endogenous variable is related to the hundred instruments via this equation. So these are instruments. These are coefficients on those instruments, and. Uh, the, each coefficient is mu raised to the power j to the power j, where mu is less than one in absolute value. So the coefficients here decay very quickly, and um, this is a, an example of an approximately sparse model where most of the information is contained in just a few instruments, with l l largest coefficients. Right. So first, let's first look at the case where uh, p is equal to 100. Uh, and n is equal to 250. We re regulate this parameter mu so, so that the typical value for the first stage f statistic is about 40. That uh, th 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 this is done to calibrate this um, experiment to the uh, empir empirical example that we are analyzing in the paper. We have two uh, two estimators here. The, our estimator, the two-stage least squares with lots of selected instruments, as well as the Fuller's form of two-stage least squares that uses all the instruments. And uh, here, the Fuller's form of two-stage least squares is used because this is the form of two-stage least squares estimator that is consistent under many instruments. And it's a de facto state-of-the-art method. So we don't, uh, we want a tough, co tough competitor for our method. We don't want we don't want some easy to beat uh, strawman, right? So we want a tough competitor, and so this is a good good be benchmark. Um, we're gonna two, we we we'll, we'll look at two metrics for performance. One is root mean squared error, and another one is five percent, well rejection frequency for the nominal five percent tests of testing the true null hypothesis, right? So a nominal five percent test should reject, ideally, the true hypothesis only with the nominal frequency, like 5%. Right? So ideally, we should see 5% here. OK, so let's, let's first look at the root mean squared error. The Fuller uh, gives us a root mean squared error of 0.13. Our new estimator gives the root mean squared error of 0.08. So it does a lot better here than the root mean squared, well, visibly better than the, than the Fuller's estimator. In terms of rejection frequency, Fuller does slightly better. So it, it's, it's only half percent off, and our estimator is 1% off. But still, like, it does a very good job at, uh, at controlling the rejection probability. Right. So all, all in all, like, uh, it seems like a good performance. Next, we change the setup a little bit. We drop. The number of uh, observations, so we decrease the number of observations from 250 to 100. Okay? And this causes the Fuller estimator to break down. Uh, essentially, uh, it starts to have a very large root mean squared error, which is 505. Our estimator, uh, which is the two stage least squares with lots of selected IVs, Still, still does very well, 0.13 uh, root mean squared error. This is just as well as Fuller was doing with 250 observations, right? So 0.13 here, 0.13 here. Right? So here the, 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 the advantage now becomes very big. 
And in terms of rejection probability, our estimator still delivers a rejection probability that is very close to the ideal level, 5%. So we have 6% instead of 5%, but it's pretty close, right? So um, we find the performance of this new method uh, to be quite reassuring. Hopefully it gives a nice uh, illustration of how uh, modern high dimensional methods could be used in, uh, in uh, rel re relevant empirical problems like this, right? Okay, so this is uh, that. So next I'm gonna change gears here and I will talk about a different problem. It's going to be a problem of performing estimation and inference on treatment effects in a partially linear framework. Equivalently, uh, this is a problem where, where we perform inference in a regression, where we're interested in a particular regression coefficient, and we don't care maybe necessarily about the entire regression function. So we, so we, we will be interested in a particular coefficient, such, such as uh, alpha here that you see, and we, we will not necessarily care about all the other regression coefficients. Okay, so this is an equivalent regression language, but I will mostly use the treatment effect language in what I do. So let me start out by, by an empirical example, and then I will present uh, some Monte Carlo experiments as, as well as theoretical results afterwards. So in this example, we will look at the cross-country growth regressions, and there we're interested in analyzing the relation between the realized growth rates and the initial level of uh, per capita GDP, GDP uh, across countries. So GDP stands for generalized domestic product. Um, we would like to estimate this relationship conditional on covariates that describe access to uh, various market institutions and technological factors. So specifically, we're interested in estimating this regression func uh, function here, or uh, this relation. Here we have a realized growth rate. This is our uh, y. This is the intercept. This is the main regressor of interest, log of GDP. So this is log of the initial level of per capita GDP across countries. Uh, um, alpha here is the main re regression coefficient of interest, or Using the treatment effect terminology, it would be called the average treatment effect. These are the controls that appear here in an additive fashion. And this is the disturbance. I here stands for the uh, observational unit, right? So which is a country here. And the assumption on this disturbance is that the conditional expectation of the disturbance given, given the main regressor and other regressors is equal to zero. And we are interested in this coefficient here for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is uh, testing the conditional convergence hypothesis, namely that alpha is less than zero. This hypothesis says that poor countries tend to grow faster than the rich countries, and therefore they tend to catch up with richer countries over time, conditional on access to similar institutions and techno technology. So this is a classical uh, prediction derived from the from the solo growth model, but it's also an intrinsically interesting hypothesis, right? So we will follow the Bar Lee uh, uh, study that uh, analyzed regressions like this using uh, the data set that, that they constructed themselves. Uh, that data set is interesting because the number of covariates there that we, or the number of controls is comparable to the sample size. In econometric terminology, this, we could say, well, the p is large here. It's not larger than n, but it is pretty large. Right? And if we just include all the controls in this regression, all the results will be statistically insignificant, and we cannot really test the statistical, uh, statistically this convergence hypothesis here. And so it's a good idea to do selection to see if we could improve uh, the precision of the estimates. And then the question is, how do we do selection here? So there are two basic options. One option is the naive uh, option, naive textbook selection option. So if you, if you uh, typically, if you run in, 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 the, in the corridor, if you run in a, in a fellow, uh, into a fellow econometrician, um, 
and ask a question, so how do I, how do, I uh, do selection? I have many variables. How do I do uh, selection and inference there? Uh, the, the typical answer would be, well, you just uh, you use lasso or whatever models like other model selection devices. You could do t tests. Um, you drop the variables and then you estimate the model and you're fine. Under some uh, assumptions, you might be fine, but but the assumptions are very fragile. So I'm I'm, I'm actually gonna, going to argue against uh, against this uh, technique. So I say don't do it here. So this naive technique uh, proceeds as follows. So as I said, what we, we, in the first step, we, uh, we drop all the controls that have small coefficients using model selection devices. The modern techniques, such as lasso, or classical te techniques, such as t-tests, and so on. Then in step two, we run least squares of yi on the main regressor of interest, di, and the selected regressors. So this is a classical uh, approach, naive approach. I also call it textbooks uh, approach here in the slides. It does not work um, because it typically fails to control for the emitted variable bias. Even though this st step, step number one is very intuitive, right? It should con intuitively it should control for emitted variable bias, but actually it doesn't control, and I'll explain why. It's not enough to control the emitted variable bias. There is also a theoretical result that uh, Lieb and Pocher um, uh, have uh, established that says that this method um, breaks down, it's fragile, and it fails to, to, to deliver the promised performance theoretically. And I'll explain, uh, I'll, I will explain their result in more detail later. So instead what we propose, we propose the following procedure, the double selection procedure. Uh, we, we will just have an additional selection step compared to the previous uh, previous approach, the naive approach. So the first step will be the same, essentially the same. So we will just select the controls that predict the outcome variable. The second step uh, will select the controls that predict the treatment variable, di, or the main regressor of interest. And the final step, we run least squares of the outcome variable on the main regressor of interest, or treatment variable, and on the union of controls selected in steps one and two. And the claim is that the, uh, the, uh, this additional selection step controls the emitted variable bias under reasonable conditions. When we apply this double selection procedure to this uh, empirical uh, problem that I've described, we find that this alpha, uh, the, the, the point estimate of alpha is negative, and the confidence interval excludes zero. So let me show you these results. So these are Barrow and Lee results. They, they did heuristic selection of controls. They, uh, they thought hard about which controls to include or exclude. Right, so there was a heuristic specification search that they did. The, 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 this is their point estimate. This is a standard error. So the confidence intervals also exclude zero, so supporting the conditional convergence hypothesis. This is our estimation result, the post-double selection procedure gives us the similar point estimate, point of three, and uh, standard error, which is bigger, point of one, but the, the confidence interval st still includes, ex uh, robustly excludes uh, zero. So if we take this 3%, plus minus 2%, we get uh, a confidence interval that, that, is well f uh, that is well away from the zero. Okay, so what's interesting here is that, well, I actually find th 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 this to be interesting results. So there's no surprise here maybe, but I do find it, it's interesting that a hard thought economic approach for selecting of variables gives us the same results as our uh, double selection approach, which is kind of a hard thought econometric approach to, to, to doing selection here. So they are very much in line, and so I find it very reassuring. So there's, some, there's probably some common sense underneath all of this. Okay, so this is one. So, so, so we do end up uh, supporting their conclusions, the Barron-Lee conclusions. Um, in terms of 
particulars of selection, our double selection find actually eight controls. So the first step, the first step does not find uh, very many controls, but the second step that uh, that I had here finds a lot of controls. I mean, not a lot, but but eight controls, uh, which include trade open openness and several education variables. Right. So you can find the details uh, in the, in the reference that I provided, but. Uh, um, uh, um, Anyways, uh, so, um, all right, so, okay, so let me show you other results that we see here in the table. Uh, so this row here, uh, it says all controls. So this is what happened, this is what happens when we include all the controls. So if, if we use all 60 controls that we have, we get the same point estimate, 0.02, but it's very imprecise. So this is not a very useful estimate. If we use the naive selection or textbook selection that I described, we get this point estimate, 0.01, with this standard error. This is actually the, the smallest standard error of all. So the naive selection gives you this smallest standard error. And then the point estimate is this. If you look at this estimate and compare this estimate uh, to our estimate, there is actually a, um, a difference which is uh, both economically significant and statistically significant. Because economically, it, it implies very different speed of catching up. And also, if you run a Hausman test on, on uh, comparing these two estimators, you're going to reject the null hypothesis that the limit uh, for those two estimators is the same. So it's, it's like, although like if you look uh, at these two numbers, you must, say, you must say, well, you know, they work similarly. No, they don't, actually. There is a there is both economic and statistical difference here. Okay. So in this uh, this empirical example illustrates the point that this naive selection does not control bias, the omitted variable bias, and I will explain to you theoretically why it doesn't. Right. So let me set up things uh, formally. Um, um, so. Uh, uh, in, in, the f in, in, in formal notation, the previous example could be written as follows. We have outcome variable. This is treatment. This is uh, treatment effect. This function g um, is everything else in the regression. So zi is a, a controls. g is, a, is the unspecified uh, regression function. This is uh, disturbance, zeta. The conditional expectation of the disturbance given the uh, controls and the main regressor is zero. And uh, so that's the setup. And what's also important for our setup is going to be the second equation. Usually we don't write a second equation when we deal with, with simple regressions. Typically, you only see those uh, second equations when, when, when you deal with uh, instrumental variable models. This is not an instrumental variable model. This is just an exogenous straight, like straight, like very plain regression. But we do need the second equation. What the second equation does, it relates the treatment variable to the controls via this unspecified function m plus a disturbance. Expected value of the disturbance given controls is equal to 0. And this function m here is going to summarize the, the, the so called confounding effect. And it's respond, uh, responsible for the emitted variable bias. So um, namely, if, if you wanted to estimate this alpha by just running a simple bivariate regression of y on di, you wouldn't be able to do so uh, unless this m function is 0. So in general, it would, would not be equal to 0. So it's responsible for for uh, for uh, omitted variable bias. OK? So and we will need to work with both equations in order to provide a good way to estimate this alpha and good way to perform inference on this alpha. We will use the approximately, uh, approximately sparse uh, framework to model both G and M. So we write G is equal to uh, a, a, a sparse approximation plus an approximation error. M is also equal to sparse approximation plus an approximation error. So here, Xi's will, 
will denote the technical controls that we use. So they could be either original controls or transformations of the original controls or, or the mix of the two situations, like before. And like before, we make the assumption, uh, assumptions uh, that uh, uh, the sparsity indices for this parameter vector and this parameter vector are small compared to the sample size. So in short, I just write G and M are approximately sparse. I've stated this assumption many times, so now I don't need to repeat it. Okay? So, and then the approximation error is going to be small compared to the size of the conjecture estimation error. Okay. Okay, so I emphasize that we need to, to work with both equations. What happens if we just work with one equation only? Uh, if we work with one equation, we, we, we run into a problem. This is what naive or textbook inference does. We have, uh, and I, I will explain now like what's, what's wrong with this procedure. So, okay, so, we, so suppose we have this single equation. We don't look at this uh, um, second equation. So this is our outcome. This is the main regressor. This is xi. This, this is approximation error. This is disturbance. So the naive approach would select the control terms here by running the lasso or various uh, types of lasso of uh, outcome variable on the treatment variable and the controls. And then re-estimate alpha by least squares of y, the outcome on treatment, and the selected controls. And just apply standard inference. And under some assumptions, it works, actually. So if, if, if um, if somehow uh, perfect model selection happens here, this approach is fine. And, and the perfect model selection will happen if, uh, if a separation condition holds. You, you, you need to have a lot of coefficients well bounded away from zero. And then the rest, all the rest should be zero. So there shouldn't be, uh, there shouldn't be, um, there should be a gap between the non-zero coefficients and the zero coefficients. If this happens, then this procedure works. Unfortunately, this assumption, the good separation assumption, is not very re realistic. If you write down any, uh, any simple examples, uh, like the ones that I've given you, they typically involve the coefficients decaying to zero. So you shouldn't expect the separation assumption. And once the separation assumption breaks down, the procedure also breaks down, and, and very badly, actually. Right, and this uh, theoretically this has been established by Lieben Pocher, the breakdown, and practically um, it's uh, it's uh, I, practically uh, um, I'll just show you a couple of examples to con to convince you hopefully that it, it it just doesn't work practically as well, right? Um, so let me show you the following Monte Carlo example where uh, the number of controls here is going to be 200, but I could have constructed the, the same example with the number of controls equal to one. I don't, need, uh, I, don't need, uh, I don't need 200 controls, but I do need it for later, so w when we talk about our proposal. So the number of controls is 200, the number of data points is 100, alpha naught, the target parameter is 0.5. We have two equations. So uh, here we have the controls appearing in both equations. And the controls have coefficients of this form, C, C, Y. C is a scalar here. And theta naught is a vector that has components that nicely decay to 0. So these, co these coefficients that nicely decay to 0 according to this law, 1 over j squared. And then these coefficients are multiplied by the scalar to induce to induce uh, d d uh, different R squares in this equation. So the, if, if, you if you set CY to zero, the controls don't matter for the outcomes. If you set CY to be like very high, then the controls uh, play a very important role in determining the outcomes. Likewise here, we have a similar setup. We have a coefficients here, theta naught, following a nice uh, decaying pattern. Uh, these coefficients are multiplied by the scalar and we vary the scalar to induce different R squared in this equation, right? 
regressors are going to be drawn from a multivariate uh, Gaussian distribution, allowing for some non-trivial correlations. So first, I show you the case where the R squared in these two equations has been set to 0.5 and 0.5, so 50-50. This blue histogram is the actual distribution of the naive post-selection estimator. And this normal 0, 1 distribution is what we would like to, to, to have, ideally. So if, if, uh, if we had perfect selection here, uh, the, the, this ideal, sorry, the, 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 the ideal distribution would be normal 0, 1. And under perfect selection, the theorems, the positive results about the naive uh, estimator say that this, esti uh, that this distribution uh, should be close to this normal 0, 1 distribution. But in reality, it isn't. It isn't, right? And uh, by the way, there's nothing crazy about this setup. There's, 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 there's no, no, nothing special. We just have coefficients nicely de decaying from 0. I didn't do anything special to, 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 to create this picture. Right? So what does, it, what does this mean in practical terms? Well, in practical terms, it, it means that the naive post-selection estimator is badly biased. So you see that the, uh, it, the, the finite sample distribution has two modes, this mode and this mode. And either, either, of, the modes, uh, either of the modes is not centered at 0. So there's a huge bias here. And, uh, also, you end up with misleading confidence intervals. If you use this normal 0, 1 law to, to build confidence intervals, you end up with, uh, with very misleading uh, statements. Right? Your confidence uh, intervals will under, undercover. Equivalently, uh, the, your, your hypothesis test will over-reject the, the null hypothesis. And so this is a practical uh, evidence. And also, there is theoretical evidence against this naive post-selection provided by Lieben Pocher, 2009. Again, it's related to the uh, um, impossibility of making perfect selection. And once you don't, you don't have perfect selection, you end up with uh, uh, very big omitted variable biases, as I, I will explain later. Okay? So, so far. I'm just saying that it will have um, a large immediate variable bias. You see this bias actually showing up here. So I, I would say this mode is, is largely created by the omitted variable bias. OK, so let's uh, look at uh, another side of the same coin. So here we will look at rejection probabilities of testing a true hypothesis. OK, so a, 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 a testing procedure that has nominal size 5%, ideally should have 5% rejection rate of a true hypothesis. So the ideal picture that we should see is something like this. This is the ideal picture. Let me explain here uh, what this picture um, means. So on this axis, we have the R squared in this equation. On this, pick, uh, on, on, on this axis, we have the R squared in this equation, actually for this part of the equation. Um, this is uh, the ideal rejection rate. And each point here corresponds to, data, to, to, to a different data generating process. Right? So we vary the scalars. Each value of those scalars induces a, data, a different data generating process. Right? So for example, if we set the scalar CD to be 0 in this equation, then controls play no role in predicting the treatment variable. And this places us here. Uh, this places us here, actually, anywhere here uh, on this line. This is the case where the r squared in this equation is equal to 0. Right? And then as we, as, we, uh, as we increase this value CD here, we could increase the, the first stage r squared. And, uh, look at the resulting rejection probability. So ideally, we would like to see a picture like this. For any testing procedure, this should be the ideal picture. But what we get in reality is this. This is, uh, this is w what we would like to see. What we g get instead is this. So these are rejection probabilities of the naive post-selection method. right? So rejection probabilities deviate a lot from the target 5%. 
for most of data generating processes. In fact, here the picture is truncated, so here the rejection probabilities they approach one. So it's really horrible, uh, really horrible there. And uh, the only cases where it works is that if you, if you uh, first, the first, uh, the, the, the R squared in the first equation to be uh, zero, so basically you um, set, this co uh, set this coefficient to be zero, then the controls play no role in predicting treatment variable, so they don't predict the treatment variable. In that case, it actually doesn't matter whether you drop them or not, and then the procedure actually works. You see this, there's this thin line along which it works, and then there's a small area as well where it works. So it's actually very interesting that in this area, this, uh, the signal in the outcome be equation becomes so strong that you're actually able to find the right controls and able to control the emitted variable bias. But this occurs only in the very small part of the data, uh, of the parameter space. So it only occurs for a small set of data generating processes. Okay. Right. But otherwise, overall, it just doesn't work. And again, this is consistent with uh, results of Lieben Pocher. Like they, they wrote a bunch of theorems uh, saying that this should happen, and we see that this does happen. Um, okay, so let's, um, uh, uh, let's look at our procedure. So f f f the formal description of our procedure is as follows. So to define the method, uh, I introduce the following reduced form. Basically, what, what I do here, I, um, in the first equation, I, j I just substitute out the treatment. So I just write uh, outcomes as a function of controls and the treatment as a function of controls. It gives me two ap approximately sparse regression models. And what we do here, we apply lasso to select controls here and there. Okay, so in step one, it's going to be direct step. Uh, uh, we apply lasso to this equation, and then we select the controls that predict y. Then we, uh, in the second step, we apply lasso and select the controls that predict d, the treatment variable. Then in the final step, we run the least squares of the outcome on the treatment variable and the union of selected controls. So mathematically, we're solving a least squares problem where, uh, where, uh, where our estimator, the final estimator, is going to be alpha check, better check, minimize the least squares criterion function, where we zero out the coefficients in front of controls that haven't, have not been selected by these two, uh, two steps. Right? So we have two model selection steps. We take the union of controls, we run the least squares of the outcome on the main regressor of interest and the controls. And this is the post double selection estimator. Uh, this estimator has been introduced uh, in, uh, in two papers um, by um, Alex Belloni, Chris Hansen, and myself. Uh, one paper studied the Gaussian case, and another paper studied uh, a, more, uh, a more general non Gaussian case, as well as more general versions of this procedure. So actually, this procedure, there's nothing special about Lasso. You could, you could use other model sel selectors. And also, you could have additional selection steps where you, you say, well, um, for example, like in, pr in practice, you could say, well, Lasso found me uh, this uh, set of controls and this set of controls. But I would also like to include that other control that I really like. And I think it's important for um, controlling omitted variable bias. Uh, the, our theory actually allows for that. You could have additional controls. Just for pr in, in this presentation, I'm not showing this possibility, but it's, uh, it's, it's there. So it's, you can find it in this, uh, in this paper. Um, right. And here's how it works in the, in the same Monte Carlo experiment as before. So same, exactly the same Monte Carlo experiment with R squared and two equations equal to, to, to 50%. This is the, um, the blue histogram, the exact finite sample distribution of our estimator the standardized form of the hour estimator, to be precise. This is a normal 0, 1 curve. Right. And our main theoretical result will be that uh, in, in large samples, our estimator will converge in distribution to the normal 0, 1 distribution. So this, is a, this, this, uh, uh, this Monte Carlo experiment is fully consistent with our theoretical results. And in practical terms, what we see here, we will have a low bias inaccurate confidence intervals based, uh, based on this normal zero distribution, right? 
So basically, it works. Right. OK, but then maybe it works only for this uh, special case, r squared 0.5, 0.5. So let's see if it works more generally. So we're going to go back to our rejection plots and see and see if, if this rejection prob probabilities would vary uh, with the underlying data generating process. Again, this is the ideal rejection surface that we would like to see. And this is the actual rejection surface for the double selection method that we, we, we see, we, that we get. And it's not equal to the ideal. You see that there is a lot of, I mean, there is some bending here, like there is deviation away from 5% here and, and here. But all in all, it seems to be doing a pretty good job at delivering um, rejection rates that are close to the promised uh, rejection rates. So this left plot is the rejection frequency for the t-test based on the post-double selection estimator. And th there is a theoretical result in our paper that says that th these rejection pro probabilities will uniformly converge to these rejection probabilities as n goes to infinity. So this is actually a, a practical verification of theoretical result in, in our paper. OK, so let's build some intuitions. OK, so we see that uh, double selection method is robust to model selection mistakes somehow. I said Lasso is bound to make model selection mistakes. And in the computational uh, experiments, we have a data generating processes where coefficients decay smoothly to 0. So therefore, we have some coefficients that we cannot tell apart from 0. So we must be making some, uh, uh, we must be making some model selection mistakes there. So Lasso makes those model selection mistakes. But somehow, in the end, it still works. So why is this? And um, the critical step here is this introduction, uh, is, is the second step. So the introduction of this uh, selection step precisely controls the emitted variable bias. It says we, need, we do need to, to include the controls that are related to the main regressor of interest. And this, uh, this creates this robustness against moderate uh, model selection mistakes. Another piece of intuition could be had by uh, um, recalling what the free schwa procedure does um, in, the, in the usual regression setting. You remember, like, free schwa procedure is, is, is a way to perform estimation. Uh, in regression, you, you say, well, uh, if, if, if you want to get a, uh, an estimate of alpha, you, what, you, what you want, you want to take, uh, you, you want to take out the, the effects of x of, on both d, the treatment variable, and the, uh, and the outcome. And then, uh, like, uh, 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 regress one residual on the other. So essentially, the, uh, our procedure is a, is a selection version of free schwa procedure. Uh, obviously, you couldn't do a pure free schwa procedure here because, well, if p is bigger than n, then you, you end up uh, um, with zero residuals um, and nonsense results at the end. But uh, our procedure is, is a simple selection version of a free, sh um, free schwa procedure for estimating linear regression. So this hopefully provides some uh, uh, piece of intuition. And there is even more, intu more intuition coming. And you would appreciate this uh, intuition if, you're, if you like econometrics. Okay? Um, so let's think about the omitted variable k. Uh, sorry. Let's think about the uh, omitted variable bias in the case uh, where we just have a single control. So we have an equation with a single control. This control is related to the treatment variable. And what we want from our technique, well, we, we promise that it works with a lot of controls, but it better work, it better work with one control, right? Um, okay. And um, so let's see what happens. OK, if we, if we somehow end up in, including this control in the regression, well, nothing bad happens. We just run long regression, and we are fine there. We know that. So th the bad things could only happen if we drop the, this extra control. The, if we drop the control, then we, run sh then we run the short regression of the outcome on the treatment variable. And then we, we could express the, the resulting estimator minus the estimate times root n as equal to some good term that will be asymptotically normal, and the omitted variable bias term, which includes root n product of two nicely behaved numbers. So this, this is uh, bounded. This is bounded. 
And then we have product, product of coefficients gamma and beta. Gamma is the coefficient here, and beta is the coefficient here. So g gamma measures how important controls are for predicting the treatment. Beta measures how controls, how important controls are for predicting the outcome. And the, this is the emitted variable bias. It, it's a product of those two terms. And what uh, what the naive selection does, it drops this control. If if beta, so naive selection works only with this equation, the first equation, and it draw, drops this control only if beta is uh, close to zero. Specifically, for, for the choices of penalty levels that I described, lasso will drop that beta if beta is of order square root log n divided by n. But this doesn't guarantee that this term goes to zero. So ideally, we, we do want this term to go to zero. Specifically, we want root n gamma beta to go to zero. But if gamma is not equal to zero, then root n gamma times square root log n divided by root n, well, it actually goes off to infinity at the uh, at the speed of square root log n. So this post naive estimator, despite having a good term here, actually diverges off to infinity after normal, normalizing by root n. Re remember, the, the, we're scaling this omitted variable bias by this root n term. And so this, this number drifts off to infinity, and so this post-naive selection estimator breaks down. The, the, the double selection procedure is actually a lot more conservative. It actually drops xi, and therefore we end up with, in a case like this, only if both beta and gamma are small. Specifically, we, we, we drop xi, the control, only if beta is of order square root log n divided by n, and gamma is of order square root log n divided by n. And therefore, we have root n gamma beta is going, is going to be at most of order log n divided by square, square root n, and this term goes to zero. So the omitted variable bias term multiplied by root n vanishes, and the good term wins. And therefore, the, 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 we, we have good asymptotics for the uh, post-double selection estimator. Okay. And here's the theoretical result, finally. So uh, um, we show in our paper that uniformly within a rich class of models in which G and M admit uh, an approximately sparse approximation with sparsity index being this condition. So sparsity index squared has to be small compared to the sample size. And uh, other practical conditions holding, such as the one that I listed before, we have that um, alpha check estimator, the post-double sel selection estimator, minus the estimate times root n times the scaling factor converges in distribution to the normal 0, 1 distribution. And here, the scaling uh, factor involves the standard expression Robinson's, uh, uh, oops, I misspelled Robinson, uh, um, is, uh, is Robinson's formula for the variance of least squares estimator in the partially linear model. So in a nutshell, like if you, if you use our procedure and then you just use the um, standard, standard errors that Stata provides in, 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 as, uh, in the final, um, as the output to the final step, those standard errors are valid. And uh, there, uh, so I could have also referred to White here, but uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm referring to Robinson because he, he, he is the one who worked a lot on partially linear models and um, established uh, uh, some good results about partially linear models. And we, like our result is a generalization of uh, Robinson's, Robinson's results. Uh, so also under homoscedasticity, this post-double se selection est estimator is going, is going to be semi-parametrically efficient. What does this mean? It means that uh, under the same assumptions, you cannot find an estimator that, ha that has this normal 0, 1 asymptotics uniformly in the same class of models that has uh, asymptotic variance smaller than our estimator. So you cannot do better than what, uh, what this estimator does under the same assumptions. So in some, sense, uh, in some sense, well, I said our procedure is more conservative, but, but this is just, uh, just about the right amount of conservativity. 
this, uh, this, uh, this conservativity buys us this nice result, and we cannot do better, at least under homoscedasticity, uh, than that. And here, um, um, models, uh, the key point here um, is that model selection mistakes are symptotically negligible due to uh, the use of double selection. Right. This is the key, the key, the key result, the key point. Okay, so this is a theoretical result, and what I will do next, uh, next, I will, I will present several generalizations, and this is go this is going to be bonus a bonus for you. Uh, <laughs> it's. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's start material, so this is advanced material, and it's going to be tough. It's, it's not going to, it's not going to be easy. So just uh, um, uh, enjoy, enjoy it if you can. Yeah. And, uh, um, so the question is, can can we generalize this procedure? So this this procedure somehow exploits linearity. So in 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 in, in IV we in uh, in the IV problem we use. This, uh, um, the linearity of the problem quite a bit, and we relied on a special structure there. Here we're ex exploiting also linearity as well, and this double selection somehow exploits the structure of the problem like very heavily to, to overcome the model selection mistakes in inference. The, and um, can we generalize this? Right? Can, we, can we construct uh, procedures for nonlinear problems that have similar robustness properties? With procedures that are that don't break down under um, um, moderate model selection mistakes, and in order to proceed with these generalizations, we can try to understand uh, how this double selection works in terms of m moment conditions, because once we write down the the moment conditions, we could see the path to to the generalization. And so um, the claim is that the double selection procedure implicitly identifies of uh, so identifies the uh, target parameter of this moment condition. So this is a method of moments estimated based on this moment condition. And this moment condition has this function mi, which is a function of alpha, target parameter, g, nuisance parameter, and m is the nuisance parameter. And then we have this residual here, yi minus d, uh, d alpha minus g. And then we have a, a quasi instrument here, di minus mzi, right, where we took out so here, by subtracting off m, we uh, taking out the uh, correlation uh, of this term with, uh, with, with anything that is a function of g. So anything that is a function of z. So, so for example, this part uh, would be uncorrelated with this part when this m and g are evaluated at, the, at their true values. So somehow we are uh, using the structure here. And then we're estimating the true values for, of g and m uh, using um, post-selection estimators. So we're using, implicitly, we're using the controls that we selected to, to estimate them in, in the procedure, the, the post lasso procedure. Right. And the, the reason why, why double selection works, actually, despite the fact that G and M are, quote unquote, crudely estimated via post selection methods, so the rate for estimating the G and M is lower than root N rates, right? Um, this double selection works somehow, uh, and it works because actually this, the, 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 this moment function here is somehow immunized against perturbations in G0 uh, and M0. Specifically, um, the following condition holds. The directional derivative of this function here, of this moment, with respect to G, so you perturb G around the, the true value, so you compute directional derivatives, and all of those derivatives are equal to zero. The, the directional derivatives with respect to m, when you perturb uh, m around the true value, are also equal to, to zero. So somehow, small small mistakes, uh, small mistakes in G and m, they don't affect identification of the parameter. And this is the same intuition as we had uh, with uh, with instruments, like emission of instruments. Somehow it does not. Well, emission of instruments that are not very good at predicting the um, the treatment variable is not it does not does not impact identification somehow. So this is the intuition. And precisely this property, if you have this property, then you could expect that the moderate selection errors 
um, are not going to have impact uh, on the asymptotics of the estimator because these moderate selection errors translate into moderate estimation errors, and they, in asymptotics, they wash out because they are uh, multiplied by, the, by terms like this. You start t taking expectation. Uh, uh, when, 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 you, when you use the empirical analog of this equation, you start doing a Taylor expansion with respect to G. This is going to be the leading coefficient, and it's zero. So intuitively, you don't need the root n rates. You need you, you just find the slow rates of convergence there. So this is this is the immunization or orthogonality property that is that plays a key role here. And can this be generalized? Yes, you can generalize this to, to any moment problems as long as you can you can do the following. So you need to to be able to identify the target parameter alpha naught via this equation. So you do you you, you do need strong identification for root n asymptotics. But also for robust inference, you need the immunization property. So this, uh, so we have nuisance parameter um, h here, and what we need is that this um, moment uh, is immunized against perturbations in h naught. So the, the directional derivative with respect to h has to be equal to zero. And in the case of in the case of double selection uh, approach, our h, the nuisance parameter, was uh, consisting of these two functions, the regression function and the m function, the auxiliary regression function. Right? And so as long as you can set up uh, um, um, estimation problem with these two properties, you're fine. So the, 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 uh, then you, you will have that the non-regular estimation of h, the nuisance parameter via post-selection or even other regularization methods um, will not um, Will not impact the asymptotics of the uh, um, of the estimator for the main parameter alpha naught, and you could have slower than root n um, uh, convergent estimate for uh, estimates for h. In the in the case uh, in the case of selection, you you um, this uh, this property here allows for moderate selection mistakes in estimation, and also in the absence of this immunization property, the post-selection inference breaks down. So you could see this by if you um, by, by examining the single selection procedure, the single selection procedure that we had. If we if you write down the appropriate moment condition that corresponds to that estimation method, it actually does not have this property. You can verify that it does not have this property, and therefore it breaks down. Okay, so you, you do need to get this property. And. Um, in looked uh, like when we looked uh, at the previous example from this framework, we see that well. Uh, the, the, in, in the IV model, we had success because we worked with MI function that has the immunization property. So specifically, we had the residual multiplied by G. And what happens here, if we, if we perturb this uh, G to some other value, G, G tilde, so if we replace G of ZI, the optimal instrument, by something close to the optimal instrument, the equation still holds, and the identification will still work. So we are fine. So the model, like we can, we can use post-selection approach to estimate G, and we will be fine, and there will be no impact on the asymptotics of um, uh, alpha naught hat. For partially linear model, our double selection procedures implicitly set up this um, moment function, which has this immunization property, and there we had uh, the the validity of the post-selection inference, precisely because of this property. And there is also a number, like the, the, there is a number of generalizations you could do, you could do. So, but we carried out uh, some of these generalizations to the case of logistic and quantile regression. So, if you are wondering about nonlinear problems, yes, there are generalizations to the nonlinear problems uh, such as logistic and quantile regressions. They are much more involved because well, you have to set up those equations, you have to figure out what the, uh, the these functions uh, are. The, the functions that both identify your parameter and that have this immunity, immunity uh, uh, from prosecution uh, um, uh, property, yeah? and um, as a final, uh, as a final example, I want to show you. Um, uh, I want to show you uh, the following uh, uh, results. They deal with estimate uh, estimation of. Um, Average treatment effect parameters in the in the case where we have heterogeneous treatment effects. So again, this is advanced material, but it's just going to be two slides, so it's going to it's not going to last long. Um, so here, what we do, we drop the partially linear structure completely. Previously, so I talked about treatment effect, but it, I talked about it in the partially linear framework, and you may not have liked this partially linear framework. 
So here we will drop this partially linear framework. However, we will assume that the treatment is binary. But we, we will assume that it, the treatment is fully interacted with other control variables. So specifically, we write outcome is equal to the regression function, which has this general form G, DI, comma, ZI. And this GI could be decomposed into two pieces. We switched on this part when DI, the treatment, is equal to 1. And then we switch on this part when the treatment is equal to 0. So that just two parts of the regression function. The same uh, disturbance as before. Same auxiliary equation as before. But now this, uh, 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 we could give a name to this auxiliary equation. It's a propensity score equation. It says that treatment is related to the controls via propensity score. Okay, and uh, so this is our regression function. And the target parameter of interest is going to be the average treatment effect parameter, which is, uh, which is this, which is the exp expected value of G1 uh, Z, uh, Zi minus G0 uh, Zi. So this is, this, is the, um, um, the, this is the average treatment effect for, for, the case of, um, uh, for the case where the yeah, is fully interacted with controls. And then G, G, the Gs here and Ms are going to be f unspecified. So they're going to be functions of many controls. But we, we do assume the, the approximately sparse uh, structure for both G and M, for both the regression function and the propensity score. Okay? And to give you context, uh, Chris will present uh, an empirical example where, um, where he analyzes a DI, uh, the case where, well, DI here, di, the treatment variable, is going to be 401k eligibility. The y is going to be net, net, net savings and, uh, or total wealth. Zi's will be characteristics of the, fir of, of the worker or the firm. And alpha naught, will, will, it will be the average impact of 401k eligibility on savings or um, total wealth. OK, so this gives you a context to, to this setup. And the way we proceed with estimation, well, we need to figure out the appropriate MI that has identification property and the immunization property. And it's given by the uh, Jin Han's efficient score function. Okay, So Jin Han worked out the efficient score uh, function for estimating average treatment effect. It turns out to be a function that has, uh, automatically has immunization property. Okay. <coughs> So, is, so what is this function? Well, it has a lot of um, moving parts in it, but uh, it's important to recognize that it, in, it, it involves both the G, the regression function itself, and the propensity score. So you need to model both the regression function and the propensity score if you want to be robust to, with respect to model selection mistakes. Okay? And this, um, this regression function is immuna, is, it has the immunization property, so it's, it's a robust against perturbations in G0 and M0. It has this property. You can trivially verify it. Sometimes, uh, sometimes well, in this context, this property is sometimes called double robustness in, in the parametric estimation context. Okay? And then the, um, the, the post-double selection estimator here uh, for, for average treatment effect is going to be uh, given by, by, by this expression. Essentially, we solve the empirical analog of, of this equation. So we, t we take the average over this um, and solve the empirical analog. analog. We, uh, and we get this post double selection estimator alpha check, which has this expression, again, involving both the regression function estimates and the propensity score estimates. And then we estimate GNM via post selection methods. And the result is uh, that is uh, presented in our uh, updated uh, CMAP uh, paper. Well, this paper, inference on treatment effect after selection amongst high dimensional controls. This result is, is similar to the result that I've stated. So uniformly within a rich class of models in which G and M, the regression function and the propensity score, admit appro uh, app uh, app approximately sparse form with the sparsity index being this condition. S squared has to be small compared to N. As well as we need other practical conditions such as the, such as the ones that I listed before. Um, so under these conditions, we have that post-double sel selection estimator minus the estimate times the scaling factor is asymptotically normal. The scaling factor here has this neat form. So this is just expected value of mi squared alpha naught g naught m naught. So this is very uh, easy to estimate by the plug-in principle. And moreover, this estimator is semi-parametrically efficient for estimating alpha naught. So you cannot do better under the same se se set of assumptions. Okay. And uh, 
Here, model selection mistakes are also asymptotically ne negligible uh, due to the use of immunizing moment equations. Right? So let me now conclude. So I talked today about approximately sparse models. I argued that they correspond to the usual parsimonious approach used in economics, um, but we put the specification searches on a more like rigorous footing. Right? Um, then I talked about estimating uh, prediction, uh, sorry, estimating regression functions arising in those models. We, uh, we discussed this Lasso method and post Lasso method. And then we uh, presented a series of applications. One application was selection of instruments. Another application was selection of controls in the partially linear model, where we did two things. We argued against uh, the te naive or textbook selection. And we argued in favor of double selection. So if you have to do selection, do double selection. Don't do the naive selection. And we argue that it, 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 under certain assumption, it protects uh, against the emitted variable bias. And then we argued for the use of immunized moment uh, equations more generally. Okay. Questions now.